Chemistry is basically concerned with atoms and molecules, how they interact, and how they transform into other atoms and molecules. Whether you're a couch potato or an athlete, you've heard that sugar can energize. Well, we're going to talk about sucrose. Sucrose is a crystalline powder, odorless, um, with the stored energy of the sun, and it tastes good. <laughs> it's sweet. Um, another way of looking at uh, sucrose is that it's a dimer. Of course, like in many subjects, mono means one, di means two, tri means three. So uh, sucrose is a dimer or a disaccharide. It's made up of two saccharide, uh, saccharide groups, which is uh, fructose and glucose, which each are monomers. And they come together in a bond, covalent bond, called a glycosidic linkage. And all of that is for organic chemistry and has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about. So don't worry about about it if you don't uh, recognize any of those terms. But why sucrose in chemistry? Sucrose is in general or inorganic chemistry because chemists like to burn things. <laughs> and uh, this reaction is one of the classics. And I think you would be able to infer what's going on here. People do know that you burn sugar. People know that you burn things when they go to the gym and whatever. They have this idea about stuff that you eat. You can burn those calories. So. And, and also a fireman um, would be the first to say that no oxygen, no fire. So to burn sucrose, you need oxygen. And um, looking at sucrose in terms of its uh, molecular formula, this is the general molecular formula. And uh, you see it's a carbon with M, some number M. It happens to be 12. And then it's water, H2O. It's water with uh, N because you see how um, there is exactly twice as many hydrogens as there are oxygens, 22, 11. So you could put H2O and then N there, and if you made that N number 11, then it's 11 times 2 is 22, 11 times 0 is uh, 11. And so you can see that uh, sucrose is a carbon water molecule. And uh, you can say carbon water, or you can say carbohydrate, because to hydrate is to have water. So carbohydrate, there you go. Sucrose is a carbohydrate. And uh, the other uh, molecules um, I'm sure you recognize, because uh, the newspaper boy knows these molecules. O2 is oxygen, of course. This is CO2, carbon dioxide. Um, of course, you should think about it, though. Uh, break it down, carbon dioxide. And that way, it's easier for you when you see molecules that you've never seen before and hear about them to break down their names. So for example, SO2, you now know, must be sulfur dioxide. And then here is dihydrogen oxide, which uh, most people just call water. And energy is produced, of course, by burning sucrose uh, energy is produced. This is an amazing reaction, but actually I think the opposite reaction is more incredible. The opposite reaction is taking carbon dioxide, which some organisms can do from the air, and taking water, some organisms can take that from the air as well, either through uh, moisture or through rain, and then using energy from the sun, and then creating uh, sucrose or other substances. I think that's an amazing reaction, and oxygen actually in the reverse reaction, oxygen is just a byproduct of the making of, of this. But that byproduct has led to our existence <laughs> because uh, we need this to live. And it's funny because we, you, we need this to live, then we eat this, and then we burn them, <laughs> uh, the plants, uh, that is. I hope you got that. But anyway, uh, so we're going to talk about the burning of sucrose. Now, when you see this molecule, it is composed of these three different types of atoms in this proportion. Uh, 11 of these atoms, 22 of these atoms, 12 of these, all together in one molecule. All, being, all those atoms are being held together, bonded together in one molecule. And this, these other uh, molecules as well have that similar idea where you have 
two oxygen atoms here. You have one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms there, and two hydrogens and one oxygen atom there, all held together. And you see that with this interaction, it creates a new interaction here, a uh, new set of uh, molecules on the other side. Well, these atoms um, within these molecules, First of all, the atoms are incredibly tiny, but these molecules, even though I'm putting my hands like this, <laughs> these molecules are extraordinarily small. Now, if you can imagine being in a chemistry lab, even uh, in undergraduate studies, and you're in a chemistry lab and you're putting different substances together to make um, other molecules like this, you're usually dealing with grams. Some, you take a few grams of this, a few grams of that, you add this together, and da da da. You can't deal with molecules. They're way, way too small. And so in science, you need to develop some bridge to this level, which is unbelievably small, to, hey, some grams that you're dealing with uh, in a lab, a practical level. And so uh, this was done. And in order to uh, have that bridge, the bridge is called Avogadro's number. So basically it takes this very, very small thing and it brings it up to a level that we can work with. And Avogadro's number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. It's a very easy number to say, but it's an incredible number to try to even fathom. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. 10 to the power of 23. 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way. It's, an, it's incredible. It's, it's just an unbelievably massive number, but it shows you how incredibly small uh, atoms and molecules are. Now, you have to think of Avogadro's number just like any number. Or be, be, uh, an easier way to imagine it is, you know how we use the word a dozen? You can have a dozen roses, a dozen apples, a dozen people. And dozen always means 12. It's the same thing with Avogadro's number. If you talk about Avogadro's number of atoms or molecules or people or anything else, it's always talking about the same number. And what's interesting is when we start talking about the weight. Because you know that a dozen roses doesn't weigh the same as a, a dozen um, apples or a dozen people. And so that you would have a certain number of grams, it would be not too many for the roses, higher for the apples, much higher for the people, but you have a certain number of grams per dozen. Well, it's the same thing here. You have a certain number of grams per Avogadro's number, and Avogadro's number of things is called a mole. So you have a certain number of grams per mole. And this information you can get from the periodic table, because the periodic table has the atomic weights of the um, different uh, atoms. OK, so we have the atomic masses. Let's find out what the molecular mass would be of sucrose. So we have the atomic mass of hydrogen is 1. You can find that on the periodic table. Carbon is 12, and oxygen is 16. And what these numbers mean, uh, you know, they are AMU, but these, this also means 1 gram per mole, 12 grams per mole, 16 grams per mole. So that means we have in this molecule 12 atoms of carbon. So we have 12 times 12, and everyone knows 12 times 12 is 144. <laughs> and uh, we have 22 times 1 gram per mole. Uh, so that's going to be 22. <laughs> and then we have 11 times 16. So 10 times 16 is 160, so plus 16, so that's 176. So we have 176 plus 22, that's 196, plus 144, so we have 342, and that's grams per mole. So that's sucrose, it's 342 grams per mole, and that's how you calculate it. So obviously oxygen would be uh, 2 times 16, or 32 grams per mole. So let's continue with this, 342 grams per mole. If you were to be asked, what is the percent of carbon by mass or weight, usually used interchangeably, but it's better to use mass, <laughs> but it's used interchangeably, um, because this is not physics. In physics, it's not interchangeable. <laughs> so anyway, so what is the percent uh, weight of carbon in sucrose? 
So if you were to, if you know how to do it, just uh, do it. Pause and, and do it. And if not, we'll look at that. So we just are going to look at what percentage of this is uh, caused by the carbon. And of course, to do that, we do a simple percentage, which is uh, we start by how much carbon do we have over the total amount. So uh, that's how much carbon we have, 342 and uh, uh, 144 um, over 342. And, uh, you know, this would be a long way to do it. You know, uh, in terms of the math, you would have to reduce this and reduce it and um, get this down to 8 over 19. Then you would say as a percentage, 8 over 19 is very close to 8 over 20. And usually on the exam, you can do that. You look at the answers. They're usually far enough apart so you can do estimates. So this is close to 8 over 20. And if you multiply 8 over 20 by 5, you end up with 40 over um, 100. So that's uh, 40%. So that would equal uh, 40%. So that's the percent by, by uh, mass of uh, uh, carbon in this compound. But actually, there's a faster way to do it. <laughs> you know, if, if I was in the exam, of course, you look at the answers, and as long as they're not too close, uh, then you would look at the uh, molecular formula and you'd say, oh, well, look, a carbon is 12 and this is 11. They're, those two numbers are very close to each other. So I'm going to imagine they're the same. And then if you imagine that they're both the same, then you can reduce this to CH2O. Right, so you, you make this 11 and then you know you just reduce that, divide through by 11, and then you get C, uh, H2O. And then carbon is 12, and, um, and this uh, hydrogen is 2, and oxygen is 16. So you have 16 plus 2, that's 18, plus 12, that's 30. And so we have 12 divided by 30. And 12 over 30, well, that's just uh, 2 over 5, right? You just divide both by 6. So that's 2 over 5, and that's 0 0.40, which is the same as saying 40%. So that would be the fast way uh, to do it. Really, I wouldn't even write most of this out, but um, you can do it either way, and it's both safe, and then you can get the percent by mass. OK, so let's go a little further. So, we're, so stoichiometry is usually about balancing chemical reactions. And if they want you to do it, they'll have a rather simple uh, chemical reaction for you to balance. And you'll be able to just look at it, try some numbers, and uh, get it balanced. So that's what our next step will be. Our next step is going to be to balance uh, this reaction. So what I'll do is uh, I'm going to ask um, uh, you to pause and to try uh, to insert whole numbers, whole numbers in front of these uh, other molecules so that both sides of the equation is balanced. Because in um, introductory level chemistry, <laughs> mass always balances <laughs> on both sides of the reaction. OK, so it, it always does. You know, in, uh, in physics, in nuclear physics, um, you know, sometimes there's transformations between energy and mass. That's what E equals mc squared is all about. But um, in, in basic chemistry, there's no transformations taking place here except for um, atoms that are changing partners, new bonds, uh, old bonds being broken, new bonds being formed, and um, so that's all we're looking at. So you have to make sure that you have the same number of atoms on the left side as on the right side. In order to do that, you're going to have to insert some whole numbers uh, to create some balance in the reaction. So uh, we'll stop here. Please pause and try it. OK, so normally when you try to balance an equation, you start with the most complicated uh, molecule, and then you end with the least complicated or simplest molecule. So we look at the most complicated molecule that has the most things attached, and we see it has um, carbon 12, hydrogen 22, oxygen 11. So we look on the other side, and there's only one carbon, one molecule that has carbon. So um, we know that we're going to require uh, 12 carbons. So we put this here. Now, of course, we got, now we have uh, 24 oxygens. We'll have to keep that in mind. But we needed those 12 carbons. OK, uh, the next thing is we have uh, 22 hydrogens. So 
there's no hydrogens here. There's only hydrogens over here. So we're going to have to put something in front of here to get those 22. So we put 11. So 11 times 2, that's 22. Okay, so we have the carbon and hydrogen fine. Now on this side of the equation, we only have 13 oxygens. Now on this side of the equation, we have 12 times 2, so that's 24. And 11 times zero, <laughs> I love the whole zero, 11 times oxygen. So we have 11 here and 24 here, so that's a total of 35 oxygens. So the right side, we have 35 oxygens. And on this side, we have 11 here, okay? So that means we need 24 oxygens from this guy. So to get 24 oxygen here, we have 12. So you can check again, and you will see now that there's 12 carbons on both sides of the equation. There's 22 hydrogens on both sides of the equation, and now there are 35 oxygens on both sides of the equation. The equation is balanced. Okay, so let's go um, a little bit further. Let's say that um, we have 8 grams, 8 grams of uh, oxygen, and we have an unlimited supply of uh, sugar. And so um, my question to you is, how, much, how many grams of carbon dioxide will be produced in this reaction? OK, so we have the number of grams of oxygen, and we want to get the number of grams of carbon dioxide. Well, I don't know the relationship between grams of oxygen and grams of carbon dioxide. I do know through stoichiometry, I do know the relationship between the number of moles of oxygen and the number of moles of carbon dioxide. It's 12 to 12 or essentially 1 to 1 in terms of the, num the relationship of the moles from one to the other. So I need to convert this into number of moles of oxygen, so I know how many moles of carbon dioxide was produced. Then I can take the number of moles of carbon dioxide and determine what the mass is that is produced. So the first step is how many moles does 8 grams represent? Well, I know that the molecular weight of oxygen is is based on O2, so 2 oxygen, so 2 times 16, which is 32. So I can divide this by 32 grams per mole. So you see where 32 comes from because it's oxygen, but the grams, the reason I'm dividing it is because, and not multiplying it, is because if I divide it, I cancel the grams, and in math, a denominator in the denominator becomes the numerator. So then I get this. I get one quarter of a mole. So one quarter of a mole by, now I know some students will memorize an equation. So um, I will have to write it just, be, uh, you know, just in case that's something that you prefer. But N, the number of moles, is equal to mass over atomic weight. Now, of course, it's the same thing, number of moles is equal to mass over molecular weight because the idea is that moles is equal to grams divided by grams per mole. Grams cancel, comes up, you get moles. So this is dimensional analysis by just looking at the units and figuring it out, and this is memorizing an equation. So it's completely uh, up to you what you prefer. So I know that one quart, this is an excess, so I know that one quarter mole Will, will end up becoming one quarter mole over here. So I have one quarter mole of carbon dioxide. One quarter uh, mole of carbon dioxide. So now I want to convert this into grams. And so if you're using dimensional analysis, then you just take the molecular weight of carbon dioxide. So it's 12 for carbon and oxygen, 16 times 2. 16 times 2 is 32 plus 12 is 44. So we have 44 grams uh, per mole. Now you see, when you multiply this together, moles cancel and you end up with grams. So then you end up with 11 grams. Okay, so that's 11 grams of carbon dioxide is produced as a result of uh, 8 grams of oxygen. Now, I said that, um, I said that the sucrose uh, was in excess, and I just want to explain that whole idea. If we have exactly one mole of sucrose, exactly 12 moles of oxygen, then 
uh, we, sh we expect that we're going to get 12 moles of this and 11 moles of that. That's the balanced reaction. But sometimes you might have one of these things in excess. So if you have, say, uh, 4 moles of this and you have 12 moles of this, this limits what you can get as a product because the relationship between sucrose and oxygen is 1 to 12. If you have more than one, that's not going to help because you only have 12 of this. So this limits what you can end up getting. So this would be called the limiting reactant or the limiting reagent either, either way. So, th but th the point is that even, even if you have 1 and 12 of this, say you had 14 of this or 16, then this is in excess. The 1 limits it. So it's 1 to 12. It will react 1 to 12 to get 12, and the rest of the oxygen that you have in excess is just going to remain in excess. Of course, this uh, reaction is really what it would be called the theoretical yield, because the best, best, best result you can have is that one of these with 12 of these gets this and that. But of course, some reactions, they do not go to completion, and so then you calculate what the actual percentage yield is. That's done in chemistry labs. Uh, it's rare to have problems on exams uh, based on that, but it's simple. You know, they'll tell you how much was actually found, and then you can calculate what the theoretical yield is by using normal stoichiometry.